Welcome to Arts in the City. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson. The National Museum of African American History and Culture opened last September in Washington, D.C. One of its goals is to show that African American history is very much part of American history. Today, we meet Karen Parsons, who's trying to do just that, not with her own children, but with other children and adults alike. No, I didn't know. I hardly knew anything about African American history coming up. I mean, very little. Karen Parsons. You may remember her as Hillary Banks, the pretty, happy-go-lucky, self-centered cousin of Will Smith on NBC's 1990s family sitcom, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. But what you may not know is that beyond acting, she's committed to bringing stories of African-American achievement to children everywhere through her company, Sweet Blackberry. California wasn't known for having the particularly the best, you know, uh, public education. And I hated history because the way history was presented to me was always a series of dates to be memorized. Everyone got very serious and was telling you how, you know, how important it was and how relevant it was because my attitude towards school was like, I'm already out of here. And all I wanted to do was act. She followed that dream and after graduating from Santa Monica High School with alumni like Robert Downey Jr., Sean Penn, and Dean Kane, Karen went on to pursue a successful career in acting, but not before a few bumps in the road. I auditioned and auditioned and for things and I was getting, you know, I got like a horror film. You know, everyone's got one in their back pocket. I've got mine. <laughs> Death Spa. You think you can handle both of us after jazz class tomorrow? Well, I could sure have fun trying. And then I auditioned for The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which at the time, I think was called the, like the Fresh Prince Project or something. They didn't know what they were gonna title it. We had a lot of fun. We were very, it was a very, 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 silly, fun, loose atmosphere, you know? And I think like a lot of places that starts at the head, that would be Will, and he's very open and, you know, kind of very loose and wants to have a good time. And then when the show went off the air after six years, then it totally changed. We was robbed! <laughs> oh my God, what'd they take? People always ask, oh, we typecast, we typecast. Yeah, it was typecast. Every now and then there'd be a project that I was really, excited about, and I thought, oh, I know this, I can do this, I read the book, you know, whatever. And um, then they wouldn't see me. I couldn't get them to see me. Karen's mother was a librarian who headed the Black Research Center in South Central Los Angeles, and every now and then she'd share bits and pieces of African American history with her daughter whenever she came across it. There was one Karen never forgot. She told me the story one day of Henry Box Brown, the enslaved man who literally mailed himself to freedom in a box and my mind was blown. This story led her to create Sweet Blackberry. Sweet Blackberry is currently a nonprofit organization whose mission is to bring little known stories of African American achievement to children. One of the things that made me excited about doing Sweet Blackberry was finding a way to make history fun and engaging for children where it wasn't for me. There's something strange inside this box. It makes funny noise and teeters and rocks. A man in a box, asked Bird, but why? Cause I need to be free just like you need to fly. When I was writing The Journey of Henry Box Brown, her voice came into my head. I'd worked with Alfre before and she's an amazing woman. I reached out to Chris Rock, Janet Collins, who was asked by the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo to dance, but she had to do it in white face. And so she turned it down but went on to become the first black prima ballerina. Janet Collins, she made history. The first black prima ballerina that the world would see. My husband is, his, he has a Russian heritage. He was dyslexic. He was just pegged as stupid, but he knew what his Russian ancestors had done and their accomplishments because he knew about this, his ancestry. Now he's, you know, he's a successful professor at NYU and, you know, he's a you know, filmmaker. I definitely feel like, wow, you know, I don't have that. And most black people don't have that. To be able to call upon people, to be able to look and go, this is me and these people did these things, these great things, and that's who I am. I feel like the subliminal message is, you know, every now and then a special black person comes along and does something great. <laughs> that to me is just a really dangerous message. You're being taught that you're inadequate. 
reaching children at this young age where sweet blackberries planting seeds, one of the things I think is important is if all children learn about this history when they're young, it will affect their, the landscape of race for them as they grow up. You can learn more information about Sweet Blackberry at sweetblackberry.org and you can catch all of their videos on Netflix. This is Tina Beth Pina for Arts in the City. When it comes to art museums, New York City is home to some of the best in the world. But did you know that those very same museums are also home to some of the finest restaurants? We tried a couple that took us literally from east to west. We've thought about how we can say something emphatic about seasonal cooking, how it's connected to us culturally as Americans here, but also how it relates to this space. We really have fallen in love with the minimalist design of the room and the creative environment of the museum. Michael Anthony is the award-winning executive chef at Untitled, featured in the new Whitney Museum of American Art. The restaurant already has a James Beard Award for Best Restaurant Design and earned a two-star review from the New York Times. What we try to do is cook with humble ingredients that grow close to home. We try to translate them in flavors that are light, beautiful, and delicious. And then at the end of the day, they, they have to have a catch. There has to be something of interest that makes a New Yorker say, hey, there's something going on here. And, and that catch is what draws people back in. Part of that catch is the restaurant's emphasis on farm-to-table ingredients. I could pick up the phone and order any ingredient that I want and probably have it delivered overnight here in New York City. But it's so much more powerful when we tell our story through the lens of what grows in this area? How is it connected to the ebb and flow of, of the seasons? Chef Anthony shared some of Untitled's summer menu. So this looks absolutely just beyond delightful downright yummy. Colors play a big role in the way we respond to these dishes, so we think carefully about first, um, how do we see them? And it has to draw you in, so you know they, that, that plays an important role. And then the choice of the ingredients. This is a fluke dish, and it comes straight from someone who we've developed a personal relationship with, who grew up on the docks in Montauk, pairing it with maybe something slightly unconventional like husk cherries. So there's an interesting combination, utilizing you know local ingredients ingredients that are really in, in their moment. And then here and we then have... This is oh. a component of the chicken dish. So we have a oh, rotisserie wow. here in which we usually pair uh, rotisserie chicken that's been brined and marinated and slow roasted till it's golden and juicy. Mm -hmm. And then a piece of that is served with this crispy kind of Korean fried chicken. Oh. And then we like to dip it in a little bit of, um, it's a spicy pepper sauce. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. You don't have to climb Mount Everest to experience the flavors and aromas of the Himalayas. You can go to Cafe Sarai at the Rubin Museum of Art. Executive chef Ali Lugzada, who grew up in India, is influenced by the museum itself. The menu inspiration at Cafe Sarai comes from the artwork that's based in the Rubin Museum, and it has a lot to do with the Tibetan, Indian, and Chinese artworks that's around the museum. So when we make our menu, I always think about different layers of spices with different flavors. I try to hit all the notes. I try to hit the sweet, the sour, the spiciness, and a little bit of bitterness. For instance, we have a chicken tikka dish, which is very traditional in India and in England, where it was originated. So we try to create different layers, the creaminess in the sauce, the spiciness in the chicken, and then the garnish makes it super, super tender and makes it super creamy. And we try to keep it as healthy as possible, so we use coconut milk instead of heavy cream. Then there's Cafe Sarai's pickled beet salad with an array of spices and topped with yogurt from the northern region of India, pleasing all the parts of your palate. Your sweet, your sour, your little spiciness from the arugula. So it definitely creates layers of different flavors while you're eating it. And this menu wouldn't be complete without their signature momos, Chef Luxada's creative take on dumplings from South Asia. What we have coming to the new menu is the Reuben Reuben Momo. 
So that was inspired by the name of the Rubin Museum and the very famous Rubin sandwich. So we took corned beef and made that into a momo with sauerkraut, mustard, and the Russian dressing, keeping it very classic, but giving it a really cool name, calling it the Rubin Rubin. With the flavors and aromas that's going on in the cafe, you kind of forget the entire hustle and bustle that's going outside over there. And you just have a sip of tea, relax, try some of our amazing Indian-inspired, Tibetan-inspired food, and take it all in because it's super low-key over here. It takes you out of New York City and puts you in a whole different place. Especially on Friday nights, when it transforms itself into the K2 Lounge, offering a special Pan-Asian tapas menu to accompany the evening's DJ and events. So whether you enjoy the farm-to-table treats of Untitled or the South Asian flavors of Cafe Sarai, you will not be disappointed. Celebrated costume designer William Ivy Long's first Broadway assignment was nearly 40 years ago. He's been nominated for 15 Tony Awards and he's won six. Pat Collins visited with the legend who has dressed Broadway. Bronx Tale. A Bronx Tale, the long-running Chicago, Hugh Jackman back on Broadway and Cabaret, they are four of the more than 70 Broadway shows with costumes designed by William Ivy Long. Costumes are the closest of the ingredients to the performers' bodies. And so they have to feel right. So getting the right feel uh, is really important. And I always say costume design is helping someone become somebody else. William's creative process begins in his large Manhattan workshop. One wall is covered with sketches, fabric swatches, and photos of famous faces. To get a reaction from the director is I cover these boards with inspiration pictures like, okay, part of the reference for Rocky Horror is silent films. Then I give the director the yellow, yellow post, little Sticker. posters, stickers like this, and they go around and I say, put them on the ones that you like. So this room was created as sort of a carnival of research. Jim, where'd you get that? It's Freddie from Korea. William dressed the cast of the television special Grease Live, co-starring Kiki Palmer. Using a miniature mannequin and doll-sized clothes, William devised a way for Kiki to make quick costume changes on camera. It was like a Broadway show filmed for television. So it was a hybrid. It was a Broadway show, it was television, but it was a film and everything you saw was happening in actual time. She starts singing Freddie My Love, her kimono falls off. She's in her turquoise baby doll. She goes, it comes on her face, she, Kiki, does this, and she does this, where's the, oh, I've got a little pin. She does this, and there she is in her red gown, and she does a little red, she did it all herself, and then she walks back through the wall and she, she's looking right at you and she winks and she does this and she's back in her baby doll. Pretty exciting though, right? Not only is, 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 uh, is, is designing a musical more challenging because of the fact that the clothes have to move. They have to move and dance eight shows a week for a year. Well, you have to know your fabrics, you have to know your cut, um, if you're back, if a, say in dance, if your trousers, if the, the crotch is too low and you're kicking, that will rip right away. Did actors as well uh, become involved in the process? Oh my goodness, absolutely. I would say every costume is 50% me and 50% the performer. Cinderella's one-minute on-stage transformation from servant to princess is one of his best-kept secrets. Will you ever divulge the secret of the quick change in Cinderella, which everyone talked about? You know, no. <laughs> I love stage magic. 
that is only possible in front of your very eyes in live theater. I think the child in us, it just triggers your, your, your readiness to accept all manner of surprises and magic. William is past president of the American Theatre Wing, the organization which produces the Tony Awards. This year's ceremony aired one night after the Orlando, Florida massacre. He suggested a way to honor its victims. And I said, what if we do a simple ribbon, a simple silver, because the Tony Award is silver, and make it metallic, and make it catch the light, and just, you know, be sort of ethereal. How about like an angel's wing? We made a sample in, within half an hour, went to Hallmark, <laughs> around the corner, or Papyrus, you know, and uh, they said yes, and then we r wrangled the troops and we made like 3,000 uh, between four in the afternoon and uh, while the red carpet was going, so that was until seven. What career did you envision having many years ago? Well, when I was, my parents were both uh, theater people. I wanted to be a historian. I studied uh, history at William Mary and art history at Chapel Hill, and it was only when I was at Chapel Hill that the, the light bulb went off and I said, well, I have to become a set designer. I was raised with the, the respect and the love for live theater. I grew up in a household where play, the play's the thing. I just happened to have carved this little section of transformation magic uh, out to focus on, and Woo! I just love it. There it is. I'm Pat Collins for Arts in the City. Now 89 years old, Broadway legend and singing star Barbara Cook is telling her life story in a brand new memoir that chronicles her significant struggles and her successes. Carol Ann Riddell recently sat down with her co-author, Tom Santo Pietro. From her childhood in Atlanta to her legendary status on Broadway, then and now a memoir tells the triumphant and often heartbreaking story of Barbara Cook's ascent fall and enduring comeback. Barbara Cook emerged as a star in the 1950s, a young woman with remarkable raw talent. Co-author Tom Santopietro explains. Barbara really made her first impression in the show uh, Candide, uh, which Leonard Bernstein composed. And uh, she had this unbelievable voice that, and he wrote a score that was kind of for an opera singer. And here's this musical comedy singer who could actually sing it. And uh, she was a sensation when she opened in that show. And that's really what the biggest thing to put her on the map back in the 50s. She didn't really have traditional musical training, traditional voice training. No, she had uh, very little voice training. And she tells a very funny story about meeting Maestro Bernstein for the first time. And he said, where did you study, expecting her to say Juilliard or some institution like that. And she almost said girls high in Atlanta <laughs> because that, you know, she had just gone to high school. She just had this real gift and then eventually started taking lessons, but it was the natural talent. The road to New York was not an easy one. Cook's memoir details a complicated relationship with her mother and an at times painful childhood. Her sister died at a young age. She, at points, blamed herself for her sister's death, as I understand it. Well, that's what's so sad. It was because of what her mother said to her, um, which was based in effect. If you hadn't gotten sick and passed it to your sister, she'd still be alive. Now imagine being a little child living with that. It took Barbara a long time to, which, you know, she's very open about, to come to terms with that and talk to therapists about it and eventually understood you know, it, maybe those weren't her mother's exact words, but it's how she interpreted what her yeah. mother said. Very, very difficult. Barbara, of course, loved her mother, but her mother, uh, Barbara became her entire life. And so she, it was a very clinging relationship. It was during a visit to New York with her mother when Barbara Cook dramatically took control of her destiny. She had packed all of her clothes her mother didn't quite realize that Barbara was packing all of her belongings. And when it came time to leave, to leave she just said to her mother, I'm not going back, I'm staying in New York. And they, it's like a scene out of a movie because they went to the train station and her mother got on the train to go back to Atlanta and Barbara stayed in New York. But she had to do that. She had to do that in order to survive. 
Soon, Cook was a hit. She won a Tony for her role in The Music Man. But as her book details, ultimately her personal life began to unravel with depression and alcoholism, a dark chapter that took a devastating toll on her relationship with her son. She lost control of her life, and Adam ultimately said, I have to go live with my father because Barbara's life was in such disarray. And of course, for a parent, that would be the most devastating thing of all. And uh, I, I do hasten to add, they have a fantastic relationship today, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it was when the problem's that severe, you know, Barbara was drinking, she wasn't working at all. She had let herself go in every conceivable way. This is a very honest book, and Barbara talks about the fact that she actually was shoplifting food from a supermarket because she needed to eat. So you see, that's what's fascinating about her journey. The biggest Broadway star, and she ended up reduced to that. As the book explains, Rock Bottom was followed by an incredible comeback for Barbara Cook that eventually included sobriety. It began when Barbara met up with an extraordinarily talented uh, pianist arranger named Wally Harper. And so she had met her musical soulmate with him, which is what's so great artistically. And they started out with very small concerts and then did a night at Carnegie Hall. We're now in the mid 70s. And this Carnegie Hall concert was a sensation and was recorded because she was still Barbara Cook and they were off and running. What was the impetus for her to stop drinking ultimately? She was celebrating the f finishing a new album and she had been sober for six months and she decided to celebrate by drinking. And she drank a great deal, passed out, and when she woke up, she was in the middle of a panic attack. And she looked, it's very dramatic, she looked at the half uh, empty glass on her bedside table and in the midst of the panic attack said, I cannot do this to myself ever, ever again. She never touched a drop of liquor again. Her momentum continued. Barbara Cook went on to become a Kennedy Center honoree in 2011. I love that at the end of the book, she says she feels that she's still a work in progress. Yes, what yes. What does she mean by that? She means that she's still learning, that there's new ways to express yourself. You lose a few of the top notes, but you gain greater emotional depth and you know, that's great at age 89. She's bringing sort of this very big, complex life. Yes, that, that's it. To everything. That's a perfect way of saying it. She is bringing that whole life into that four minute song. Carol Ann Riddell for Arts in the City. In today's Hidden Gem, R. Mike Gilliam takes us on a tour of an historic cemetery, which will appeal to both history and theater buffs. The hottest ticket on Broadway is for the musical Hamilton, sold out for many months to come. But if you want to get closer to the real story of Hamilton, his history, what you need to do is travel down Broadway to Trinity Church Wall Street. That's where he's actually buried. When you step inside here, you realize that Trinity is a special place of serenity in the midst of the hustle and bustle of Lower Manhattan. Here to show us around is archivist Joe Lipinski. Joe Hamilton here has become very popular, lots of people stopping by. Absolutely, yeah, this is the burial place of Alexander Hamilton, and with the recent success of the Broadway play, he's been visited much more uh, than he had been in the past. Give me a little feel for his history with the church. Sure. Uh, Alexander Hamilton is buried here. Uh, he would have been buried here in 1804. But during his life, he also owned a pew here. Uh, he would have attended services, um, as well as his wife, uh, who's on our communicants list, uh, having received communion here. And several of their kids were also baptized here at Trinity Church. Ironically, Vice President Aaron Burr, the man who famously shot and killed Hamilton, was also connected to Trinity Church. Now, Hamilton's not the only famous person here, right? Certainly not. Okay, let's talk about Robert Fulton. Sure, yeah, just next door to Hamilton is Robert Fulton. Uh, he's actually buried in the South Churchyard in the vault of the Livingston family, a famous New York City family. Uh, but this is a monument to Robert Fulton erected by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, Robert Fulton is credited with 
inventing the first commercially viable steamship, um, which really had a major influence in the industrialization of America um, and travel as well as transport of goods around that time. So on the reverse side, you actually have his plans for a steamship. Yeah, these are it's a depiction of the plans of his ship, the Claremont, which um, is that first commercially uh, successful steamship, which used to run from New York City to Albany. Okay, Joe, this is the North Churchyard. Tell me how people can best use this space. Yeah, I mean, this area is open to the public. The churchyard is open for people to come in, use the benches, use the pathways, and kind of just sit and reflect, um, eat their lunch, be outside in Lower Manhattan. If you'd like to visit the churchyard, it's open seven days a week from 8 in the morning until 6 in the evening. It's truly a very special place. I'm Mike Gilliam for Arts in the City. That's our show for today. Thanks for watching. For more information on any of our stories or to watch them at any time, go to our website at cuny.tv. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson, and we'll see you next time on Arts in the City.